direct from Montreal, Canada. This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Uh, joining me on the phone, it is uh, guitarist Steve Rothery of the band Marillion. Their new album, with friends from the orchestra, dropped on November 29th. It is a reimagining of their selected songs from their rich catalog. And to discuss all things Marillion, it is uh, the one, uh, the only, the indefatigable former Guns N' Roses, Great White, Clarence Clemen, and more manager, Alan Niven. Rebonjour, Monsieur Alan Niven. It's been a while. Yeah, bonjour, Monsieur. Comment ça va? Is, uh, is good. I mean, you know, I'm getting older and things hurt, but... Marillion. Uh, interesting. Yes. Um, post pun um, If I remember correctly, they came from a town that was just down the road from where I grew up as a kid called Aylesford. And I was looking at their website to remind myself of their history and their extensive catalog. And there was something that jumped out of their web website that I thought, ooh, hello. And they were complaining about being impoverished and stating that EMI only paid them 15 pennies per disc, which, if my math did anything go by, um, suggests a royalty rate of somewhere between 1% or 2%, which if that was their royalty rate, well, my God, I mean, I haven't heard of a royalty rate as bad as that since the days of Jimmy Hendrix. But it does put you in a mind where you look at it and you go, you know, these record companies are making huge sums of money streaming at the moment. Maybe it's about time they stop being greedy and saying, you know, with all these records that have been on our shelves for all this time, maybe we should just go 50-50 with the artist and let them live through their latter days with a degree of comfort. I agree, and... and... Now, now we're on the same page. And I will finish with this before we get over to uh, Steve. Uh, he has a band called uh, The Wishing Tree that have made two albums. One of the albums is called uh, Carnival of Souls, which was released in 96. And guess who released an album called Carnival of Souls in 1997, the year after? That's right. Your favorite band, Kiss. See? Everything comes back to Kiss. So anyway, let's get over to uh, Steve Rothery. The uh, new album is called With Friends from the Orchestra. Voici le seul, et unique, the one, the only, Marillion's Steve Rothery. We are speaking with uh, Marillion's Steve Rothery, the new album, uh, With Friends from the Orchestra. It is, uh, it is delightful. It, Steve, great album, and uh, as we say in Montreal, bonjour, comment allez-vous, how are you? Uh, very well, thank you very much. Yeah, just um, just over halfway through the UK part of our uh, tour. Uh, I'm currently in Glasgow for an evening off. Um, then we have uh, another four shows before our two dates at the Royal Albert Hall. Um, so yeah, no, doing doing well, surviving life on the road. Surviving life <laughs> on the road. Well, in fact, let me let me just quickly ask you about ro- the Royal Albert Hall. I mean that that's not just a gig. That's got to be something special for a band, right? Oh, absolutely! It's it's an a, an event, really. It's such an incredible, uh, iconic venue. Um, just visually, it looks like nothing else. Uh, and the last sh- and the only show we played there that we filmed um, was just one of the best concerts we've ever given. So, yeah, very much looking forward to going back back there in a week's time. Yeah, I can't wait. You know, this Friday I go see. Uh, I fly down to New York to see Billy Joel at Madison Square Garden, and there there are just some venues. Where it's it's just not a show. It's it's really something completely different. Anyway, uh, let us talk about with friends from the orchestra. These these songs that have been reimagined. Um, talk to me about the concept behind this and and the creativity. Because you know, one could say, okay, let's get to the next album. Let's put some new songs together. But there's also a creative process of looking back sometimes and going, you know what? Let's reimagine this. Let's change them. Let's let's do them. So, so talk to me about that process and and coming up with these new arrangements. Well, we're in the process of writing the the next Marillion album, but that is a long, slow process. Uh, so we had the idea of of doing the friends with the uh, with with friends from the orchestra album. Uh, we'd played five shows with the quartet and the two wind players. Uh, including the, the the Royal Albert Hall we mentioned, so uh, we thought it could be a good idea to give us a bit of breathing space to uh, to look at the rest of the catalogue and imagine which of the other tracks would most benefit from this 
um, additional symphonic aspect, I suppose, if you like. You know, the idea was was to have something that uh, would be kind of complemented by the strings without uh, it necessarily dominating them. I think there's always the danger when using orchestral elements that they swamp the the music that you had and you you finish up with like a a syrupy version of of, of the music which was something we wanted to avoid at all costs uh, and i think we've done that i think mike hunter's arrangements are, are on the strings album uh, are phenomenal um i mean the players we've got involved uh, in praise of folly uh, are just world-class musicians you know play with real passion and sensitivity um uh, as well as are the two wind players sam and emma um so it's it's a perfect mix of um not losing what makes Meridian special in, in terms of the sonics but with adding these additional uh, harmonic uh, textures, if you like. Is this a case of we we tried it, we've done it, and now we move on to the next new Marillion? Or did you like the process so much where you think, okay, maybe in two years, in five years, maybe we'll do a part two with other songs? Uh, talk to me in terms of, of where do you see this going in the future with this album and this these arrangements and this music? Uh, it's hard to say, really. I mean, our, our priority once we finish this tour uh, just before Christmas is, is the next Beryllion album. Uh, pretty much all of next year is dedicated to that, uh, with the exception of uh, a week out to go and play the cruise cruise to the edge again from uh, from Miami for, for five days. Uh, but other than that, we're, we're very much... Yeah, focused on 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 trying to make the best follow up to the Fear album that we that we can. You know, I think that's the thing when you have a an album that's been very successful commercially and artistically. You know, it sets the bar very high, and it's going to take all your focus and energy to try and and match that, if not surpass it. It will. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the importance of, of making new music because there's a lot of bands, you know, classic bands, heritage bands, whatever you want to call it, that as soon as the calendar hit 2000, they went, eh, we don't really have to record anymore. We'll just play the 15 greatest hits. You guys have continuously made new music, 2001, 2004. Two, you haven't stopped. Why is it important to sort of keep that process going and not just say, hey, listen, we've got 15 albums. Let's just go play the 10 best every night. Yeah, well, we've never really been about that. We've always been about what our latest record's saying. And I think that's the whole reason that, I mean, I've been in the band 40 years this year and Steve Hogarth 30 years. And the reason that we can still come out with, with great new albums is, is that we have that creative freedom and spark and and, and uh, chemistry still. So, uh, you know, you don't want to be just a heritage band. I mean, that's kind of like, from my perspective, that's kind of what you do when you're semi-retired, really. You know, uh, but as long as the creative spark is there, uh, I mean, there's very few other bands working in in this area of music anymore. You know, we're almost kind of last man standing in a lot of ways, um, and it's it's just great to be able to do what we do and and have such an enthusiastic audience for it. It really is okay. So, so talk to me just real quick about the about the beginning. You know, you look back at seventy nine, eighty, eighty one. You know, there, there's disco, there, there's punk. Uh, there, the, the music scene was just incredibly different in terms of getting on the radio and radio airplay. And then you guys come together and you and by 83, you get the album out. Was there resistance from record companies to your sounds? Did you have a lot of times where you went and they just said, hey, this is not going to get on the radio. You can't do this. How, how difficult was it to get the band going and then get that first record out? Well, we were kind of lucky that you know, we had a fan base uh, from quite early on who was very f fanatical. So we we got to that point where we were selling out the Marquee Club in London to six or seven hundred people without any kind of deal. And the Marquee Club in those days was very much the watering hole of, of the, a lot of the music business. Um, so, you know, various managers and publishers and record companies uh, started to prick their ears up. Um and originally, we were going to sign to Charisma. Tony Stratton Smith was a huge fan of the band and actually sent a team up to sign us on 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 the tour in I think it was eighty two. But unfortunately, they didn't really get it. I'm only offered us the singles deal, which is when we went back and signed to EMI, and then when 
uh, Strat, Tony Stratton Smith found out that that his guys had blown it. I think he sacked them, uh, and we finished selling our publishing to them. So there we were with um, you know two great labels behind us, both EMI and uh, Charisma. Um, so you know everything from when we did our first radio session uh, on mainstream radio in the UK for a guy called Tommy Vance, uh, and I think it was eighty one. You know there was like a gradual increase of the profile of the band and, and a sense of excitement and people discovering it you know and and it was after punk and new wave but the people were looking the younger generations were looking something that could be their own not what their elder brothers or sisters listened to so we kind of became that for a, a lot of people yeah and tommy vance uh, you know he he he's not uh, a big name over here in in north america obviously but when i speak to any british band whether it's thunder or you or that that name always comes up. Obviously, great great importance. Um, you mentioned the fans. Uh, talk to me about your relationship with the fans, because to me, it's quite unique. You go back, for example, to nineteen ninety seven. You have this album out on Red Ant, which Cheap Trick likes to call Dead Ant, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm bringing up some scars here, aren't I? But yeah, well, no, we, we, we have many scars in terms of North American release, you know, from the back in the capital days when uh, Kaylee was breaking on the radio across North America. Uh, and the same week, the uh, the head of promotion at Capitol was, was on the national news uh, handing over payola uh, to some radio boss. Uh, and that week, the whole of the... Uh, Capital releases got pulled from 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 radio uh, just at that crucial point. Uh, otherwise, who knows? Things might have been different for us. Uh, but yeah, yeah no, we all the way down to when when C. Fergus joined the band and and the label sent out publicity photos with fish still in them. Uh, you know, it's it's we've not had an easy ride. Put it that way. You haven't. But I'm going to quote here from the Chicago Tribune in 1997. They wrote, it was an outpouring more suited to a large charity organization or disaster relief, both in spirit and in financial success. Yet it was motivated by the simple, unwavering desire of a select group of cyberspace denizens determined to see their favorite rock band perform in this country. And of course, they're referring to the, 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 the money or the drive that fans put together around the world to have this 1997 European tour. And of course, as you've gone on, you've done Pledge Music, you've done... But, but talk to me about that relationship with the fans, because if you look at an Aerosmith or a Kiss or a Metallica or, or whoever, Madonna, I'm not sure fans would do that, but there's something very unique and special about how you and your fans get along, right? Oh, absolutely, on many levels. I think the people who like this music... Uh, have an incredible passion for it. It's not just something that they uh, listen to, you know, as, as background music. It's something that they immerse themselves in. Uh, and back in '97, it was really the very first stages of the internet. Um, and the, and the, to- the US tour fund came about um, a, a guy on the freaks maiming list, which is like a bulletin board. You know, um, when we announced we couldn't afford we couldn't afford to tour. Uh, the U.S. because we lost fifty thousand dollars every time we went. Um, you know, th- he had this idea of starting a tour fund, and pretty pretty soon, I think we raised sixty or seventy thousand dollars in the end. But the, one of the most interesting facts was that the greatest single donation wasn't was actually from someone in the U.K. It's like you know this sense of well, you know, this is my favorite band. I want you to be able to enjoy them too. So I'm gonna you know, make this donation to try and help bring the guys over to you. So that, that tells you an awful lot about the, the mentality and passion of Marillion fans and, and how it's like a global family, family, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's in this case, it's very much true. You know, we have these Marillion weekends now. Um, we had five this year, um, including one in Montreal. Um, but, you have people from all around the world who, like the one in the in the Netherlands in Port Zealand, you know, we have 3,000 people from all over the world who congregate to celebrate. And, and you know, we play three days of concerts, but it's a whole event. Um, it, it's quite an, an, an incredible occasion, really. You know, people meet, make friends, get married. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, some Maybe some people would say it's it's almost cultish, but it's not really because it's about the music and it's about people's common love and passion 
for for what they consider to be great music. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think I'll go cultish, but but there really is. You sort of do work on the outskirts of the industry in terms of musically. You're not writing certain necessarily radio singles in terms of the way the fans react to you. You know, you're it's very. Um, anyway, uh, let, let me just quickly move on. Um, talk to me a little bit also about uh, pioneering uh, crowdfunding and, and working with Pledge Music and not going the record company way. How much creative freedom, freedom did that entitle you to? And now that you know Pledge is gone, how do you see yourself moving forward in terms of uh, getting albums out? Uh, well, we you know, the first albums were crowdfunded before the pledge uh album um but yeah we had the idea after we'd left yeah we had the albums with a major label then three albums with an independent and we were faced with this choice of what we do next and we had the idea of approaching our fans and seeing if they would pay for an album uh, a year before uh they were going to get it and about fifteen thousand of them said yes which enabled us to make the anarachnophobia album and employed Dave Megan to engineer and produce it and to license the finished album back to EMI. And, and you know, reverse a very much a downward trend we'd been experiencing for the previous sort of four or five years. So it, it was obvious, you know, how important our fan base was, how important the internet was, um, and, 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 and the creative freedom that it could bring you. And that's been the most important thing for us, really. Um, you know, with every subsequent album, with a Marbles album, you know, crowdfunding has enabled us to to raise more money than a major label would ever give, uh, any pretty much any artist, never mind an artist making this kind of music. So, um, yeah, it's 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 an incredible leveler. A lot of things have changed uh, over the, especially over the last twenty years in the music industry. We were never a, a trendy band, you know, we were never a, a hip band, but. I think we, you know, we've always had integrity and we've always had this passion from our audience and that's enabled us to ride the various sort of waves of fashion, if you like, in, in the industry. Uh, and, and also that crucial point, period of time where there was this, you know, the internet is the devil and, you know, downloading is killing music and uh, and all this. Yeah, before streaming became the mainstream and, and, and it takes away that whole factor it doesn't generate income still really at any meaningful level for for most bands but it um it's no longer you don't have that excuse of saying well people are stealing our music um so you know you have you have to embrace the good and the bad about the internet uh, uh and i think we've done that better than most bands uh and i think crowdfunding is still a very important part of that yeah, and it does offer a special connection to the fan base. Uh, let me ask you quickly about the other project that you've done over the years, The Wishing Tree. What is the current status of that? And then just also talk to me a little bit about branching out from Marillion in terms of why did you sort of need to go out there and do something not within the walls of or the confines of Marillion and just that sort of different uh, musical outlet? Yeah, my my two wishing tree albums. I mean, the first one came about uh, after Miles Copeland, who was the boss of one of our US record companies at the time, IRS. Uh, he had a thing called the No Speak label for a while, which was some instrumental music, and he approached me to do an album while we were making our Brave album at at his chateau in 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 France. Um, and as I started to think about it, I, I the idea of doing doing something that's more in keeping with the sort of music that I, I love to listen to. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a great fan of a lot of female artists like Joni Mitchell and Kate Bush, Tori Amos. So I fancied doing something more in that sort of genre, which was how the wishing tree was born. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a sort of thing that the people who know the wishing tree tend to really love it, but it didn't really cross over that much. Um, about Five years ago, I, I had another solo album that was a, a, actually a guitar instrumental album called The Ghost of Pripyat. Uh, and that's been a lot, lot more successful than The, than the Wishing Tree. Maybe it's because more what Pete Marillion fans want to hear, you know, is me playing the guitar. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've toured a lot with that in various places around the world. Um, I'm currently recording another solo album that's uh, called Revan Tule, which is a space-themed album. Uh, I was down in, in northern Chile in the observatories um, playing music down there for the solar eclipse uh, in July of this year. So um, I'm trying to finish that album for some time next year. 
Well, okay, so uh, tell me a little bit about that album in terms of, so, well, in t- in t- how do you sort of decide what goes then to the Marillion pile and what goes into the Steve pile in terms of songs? Uh, well, we all jam so much with Marillion that there's never really any shortage of material. Uh, and, and most of the music uh, on my, uh, on the Reventule album, some of it I've written with, with my keyboard player from my solo band, Ricardo Romano, uh, from Rome. Uh, and, you know, some ideas I've just had kicking around for a long time. Uh, it's, a, it's a different sort of creative process. You know, when you're writing solo stuff, you, you don't have, you know, it's not the kind of... Um, Getting ideas past a committee, you know, you 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 have an idea and you develop it and you you focus on what you want to do with it and where you want to take it. So it's it's slightly easier in some respects. It's it's more pressure uh, because you know when you do have a fantastic musical chemistry as we have with Marillion, um, you know you you have to try and get to the same place without the additional input. You really do. Um, just so I'll take you back to 1985, a misplaced childhood, of course, uh, number one in the UK. Talk to me a little bit about the importance of that album in your career. How important was it for the band to be number one and have that recognition? Well, it's probably one of the reasons I'm still talking to you now, really, is that uh, it it achieved such a very, very high profile around the world. You know, it sold over two, well, probably about two and a half million copies. Um, and Kaylee was such a big hit at radio all across the world as well. Um that it, it kind of it's it, in a way it's a double edged sword because on one hand it's established the band in a lot of people's minds. Uh, on the other hand, um, some people then couldn't lose that vision of the band. When Fish left in eighty eight, uh, maybe you know a third of the fans decided that was it. There was no future for them with Marillion, which was a shame. And some of those fans have, have since come back to us, but. Uh, yeah, you, if you go on the internet, you know, be it social media, YouTube, you will find there's very much these two <laughs> two camps, if you like, that uh, always want to go to war about who is the, which which aspect of or time of Marillion is, is the golden age. Uh, but the way that I look at it is, it's just it's all one, you know. I mean, I was responsible for the music and a lot of the early songs, and uh, you know, I still have a large musical input now, so. It's all one in my in my mind. It really is, and and okay. Well, I'll I'll, I'll take you up on that because uh, I'm a huge Kiss fan, and we have the same arguments about well, the '70s is real Kiss, and the '80s is not. And uh, talk to me about changing members and, and having to to put together because ultimately it's it's not just a band; it's a brand, right? Uh, yeah, so. yeah, but ultimately it's it's about the integrity of the music that you make. Uh, you know, and Fish was a, a, a very charismatic singer, had a very specific way with words, um, very larger than life personality. Uh, and when he left, it, it, maybe the music became even more important in terms of, um, you know, kind of structure and, and I suppose, ambitions. Um, you know, we wouldn't have made a lot of the, the music we've made in the last 30 years with, without Steve having joined the band, really. I mean, he's a great musician as well as being a, a fantastic singer and lyricist. So, you know, adding to the musical chemistry has, has helped keep keep the band um, focused and creative. Right. And so that, and that's, the, that, that's what some fans seem to forget. But OK, so, so when Fish leaves... First of all, how disappointing is it to you? And when you go to replace him, was it we need to find a cookie cutter kind of guy that can just sort of slot in here and nobody will notice? Or did you no. make, okay. <clears throat> yeah, no, we didn't want that. That was the last thing on earth we wanted. I mean, it, unfortunately, you know, the last year with, with, with Fish wasn't a very happy time, really. He was uh, deeply unhappy on a personal level. Uh, you know, the band was being worked too hard. And as a front person and, and lyricist, he, he had more pressure than anyone else. Um, and, you know, a different manager would have taken a different strategy. Uh, but ultimately, I, th- I think um, even if he hadn't left, then he would have left within a couple of years just because, he, you know, he had a different path to follow. Um, but then when it came to replace him, I mean, you know, I, I had no doubt because, like I say, I was responsible for a lot of the music and we, we had some great musical ideas uh, just waiting to, to, to be transformed into songs. 
Uh, uh, but we auditioned so many people, some of which was just straightforward rock singers who just didn't get it at all. Uh, or more than one uh, would be fish impersonators, uh, again, which was just so far away from what we needed. Uh, it was only when we heard Steve Hogarth's voice that we thought, well, okay, this this, this sounds interesting. It sounds a bit like uh, Paul Buchanan from the Blue Nile. Uh, Oh, yeah, really interesting voice. Let's get in, getting him in and uh, and see how it works. Thirty years later, seems to, or is he still on trial right now? Are we still testing him out. We well, still got the t-shirts. That says the new new boy since nineteen eighty nine. That's funny. You know, it's it's funny because the usually the last guy who joins is always the new guy. Who was it? It was I think Masai, Matthias Jabs or whatever of uh, Scorpions. Like I've been the new guy for fifty year or twenty five years. Anyway. Um, yeah. In terms of the future, because you look at Elton John, you look at Kiss, which I've mentioned, you look at a, at, at um, a lot of these bands. They're, they're on farewell tours. We're we're done. We're out of here. It's been it's been nice. Where do we see Marillion? Because you are still creative. You're still making new music. You're still doing the tour. You're doing the weekends. Are we thinking of the end? You know, are we on a five year plan, or is this like, nah, we're just gonna die with our boots on? Forget it. Well- Pretty much the latter, I think. You know, you have to be realistic, though. I mean, everything you do um, takes a price out of you, especially when it comes to touring, uh, you know, your sanity, your health, your hearing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the clock is ticking. Uh, I mean, we obviously we're working on album number 18. I'd really lo- I'd love to think that we can make 20 albums in our career. So which you're probably talking about another eight to 10 years, uh, by which time... You know, Ian will be in his mid seventies. Uh, it's it's my sixtieth birthday in a few weeks' time. Uh, yeah, so you can't really look much beyond eight to ten years ahead, really. But having said that, I, I can't imagine ever stopping. You know, it's like music; it becomes what you are. Uh, and what else are you going to do? You know, sit in your garden and read the newspaper. <laughs> there's not there's nothing that compares to creating something uh recording it uh and even if you don't tour as much you know trying to bring something uh fresh into the world i I agree Uh, you know uh, i would much prefer if everybody or every musician was of the bo diddley chuck berry mick jagger kind of school of thought where we just keep going i mean forget the reunion tours just or the farewell tours you know don't do a tour do 10 shows or you know anyway uh, yeah. Over the 40 years, uh, we've had Fish Leave, we had Dead Ant, we had all kinds of stuff. Were there any moments where you just looked at yourself and just went, I can't do this anymore. I, 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 this, this is this is too crazy. Were, were there times, was, was there a period of time, 80 whatever, where you just went, fuck this, I'm out? N- not really. No, I mean, yeah, we had a bit of a meltdown when we were writing the Sounds That Can't Be Made album. Uh you know, between the band and and and, and Steve, uh, but that's you know a combination of factors. And uh, when that happens, you know, it can go either way. You can either say, "Well, hang on, that's it. We uh, you know, this relationship is at an end," uh, or you take stock and and say, "Well, you know, what we create create together is so special. We'd we'd be truly insane to throw this away. Let's you know find a, a way of resolving this." Uh, which is kind of what we did, you know. After that, we went out and did uh, some support shows with Deep Purple across Germany, which was very good for for band morale. Uh, and then we went we back went back in the studio and, and and wrote and recorded the sounds that Carby made album, which is you know, in a way, beginning of a of a creative upturn. I think that carried on uh, both through, through the Fear album and then the, the release of the Royal Albert Hall DVD. Uh, and and now the strings album and you know the next studio album to be so uh, things things are, are are probably the most positive they've been in the last um, fifteen twenty years I'd say. Well, I'm amazed because the sounds that can't be made is 2012, so that means that this was going on somewhere like 2010, 2011. Normally, when you talk to a band with forty years, they go, yeah, you know, 1987 was. So you actually had a very smooth ride then for for pretty much the entire band's history except for a little bump in the road pretty much yeah you know it when you when you're in a band together for so many years it becomes a family you, you, you kind of like brothers and occasionally um you know you, you might have arguments but we're all i think 
musicians tend to be quite eccentric personalities. I think if you don't start out that way, by the time you've done it for 30 years or 40 years, you very much get that uh, happening. So we, we kind of know each other's little eccentricities now and, and make allowances, I think. that that Maybe that's the wisdom of age. <laughs> yeah, that must be. Uh, yeah, probably. Just go, ah, that's Steve. Let, let him be. Um, yeah. With Friends from the Orchestra is uh, slated for release here on November 29th. Uh, Steve, an absolute pleasure. I just, I've been trying to get a Marillion interview for years, and it's always been close, but not close enough. And, oh, they're coming to Montreal, but guess what? I'm going to, you know, some other place. Yeah. But, uh, oh, and, and let me ask you just real quick on the Montreal Sorry. thing. Just uh, I'll, I'll just finish with this. Uh, the Montreal weekend is not the first weekend. that you, you did one in 2019, but you've done them in the past. Uh, what is it about this city that is attractive to to Marillion because when you look at our history whether it's Super Tramp or Genesis or Styx or we've always been very very rabid very we find a band we like we stick with them and you can you can tap this well a hundred times and we'll still be there um from your perspective what is it about Montreal and the audiences I think there's just some understanding and passion for for great music there I mean some of the shows we used to have uh, at the spectrum you know just some most remarkable um, electric um, atmospheric shows you can imagine you know and and that's kind of carried on, on all the way through um, I mean when yeah, when we played there, when we supported uh, Rush, you know, in the mid mid eighties, I mean, there's just an understanding uh, of, of what it is that makes a band special that that you don't find in a lot of other places. I, I agree, and uh, you know, uh, we miss the Spectrum immensely. It's uh, one of the greatest venues that no longer is uh, is part of this world, but. Et voila, and Rush, of course, we love Rush, a great Canadian band. Uh, merci, Absolutely. Steve. As we say here in Montreal, merci beaucoup, an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure likewise. Cheers. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. This has been Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. For more exclusive content and interviews, subscribe on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, and many more. Follow Mitch on all the socials, especially Twitter, at Mitch LaFon, and on Instagram, at Mitch underscore LaFon. Get your Mitch merch now at loudtracks.com slash Mitch.